What is up, everybody? Welcome to Comic Book Club. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And we're coming to you live from a couple of places on the internet. We're live over at Facebook and YouTube and Twitch and Twitter. Or maybe you're listening. Twitter! Twitter. Or maybe you're listening later on uh, Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes. Those are all places where you could be listening to a podcast. The app of your choice. The app of your choice. Wherever it is. Thank you for seamless? tuning in. Seamless? Can I listen listening. to this on Seamless while my food's coming? Yeah, but not DoorDash, really. I know oh, Seamless is DoorDash, boy. but it was part of like the rights when they bought mm-hmm, each other. Mm-hmm. One went uh, on the other. I got gotcha. you. Uh, speaking of which, we should probably talk about this up front. Everybody knows the writer's strike is happening today. It kicked off today. Uh, obviously, we are uh, breaking the picket line here. <laughs> <laughs> cool that what? as scabs we, we're not writers we have bro. all There's of our no shows writing on this all show, of our shows bro. are written no they're not by a staff of writers nope. write this whole thing that's not true there's nothing written on this show bro really yeah <laughs> who's been sending me all those lines then like that oh, one sorry. that i just My said bad. somebody's I sending have, me I lines have... I have been scripting Alex for a lot of this. It's it's a bummer to have it come out now, but as a WGA writer, I am on strike from writing Alex's lines for this podcast. That's why it's been so bad so far, and it's only going to get worse from here, guys. Um, As a podcast, we're not um, covered by any uh, sort of union contract, so this show may be airing on NBC at like 1247. (laughs) Sweet. (laughs) That's a good look. Uh, That's great. Uh, I can't wait. We should. I mean, listen. There, were, we were just talking about this before we came on. That's when Jimmy Fallon usually airs, and he was real salt of the earth with his writers, as we discovered today <laughs> through several wow. tweets. We are covering Hollywood <laughs> news. What is happening right now? Yeah, this is important, Pete. You should do take part in this. You're part of this. Exactly. Industry. Yeah. Solidarity for for real though. Actually, I will say, old jokes aside, solidarity with the WGA. Support your writers. They are important. Yeah. We would have, I mean, other than the comics, I guess, which, you know, <laughs> has no union. But we basically have nothing to talk about uh, at all if there were no writers. So support the writers. What they are asking for is totally reasonable. WGA strong. Hashtag WGA, WGA strong. strong. I'll be go. picketing tomorrow. Yeah. Um, in New York City. Where are you going to be picketing? People who can do a comic I don't know if I'm up. actually, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but uh, right now, but it will be in Manhattan and I will be tweeting it out tomorrow morning. Uh, Sabaro is in exciting. Times Square? Yes, I'll be uh, uh, picketing by picketing the pepperoni off my slice because they put too much pepperoni on it. <laughs> oh, oh, there's my God, no such thing as too much pepperoni. Come on, bro. Yeah. Uh, one last thing, and then we can go to our guest. Now, normally we talk time. about the cocktails later, but I thought it would be good to bring this up now. We have Brett Macris, a.k.a. Stray Bullet, the official CBC chef. Stray he designs Bullies. cocktails for us sometimes, and he designed a cocktail, and I'm very flattered by this. He designed a cocktail for me. <laughs> what? <laughs> you? you should not be flattered by this. <laughs> no, I should. Listen, I said something that was really impactful and powerful on this past week's episode of The Stack that I definitely that meant true. to say it was purposeful. True eloquence. Yeah. yeah, it was a line that Justin wrote for me as we've established. <laughs> and Indeed. I, sure, to be honest, Alex. I don't even remember what were you t- I don't even remember exactly what we were talking about, but I accidentally it's better that way. Yeah. I accidentally said the phrase nasty bottom about something. Oh yeah, I yeah. remember yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, it's become sort of almost a catchphrase for you. Mm-hmm. So like it makes So he sense. made a cocktail called Alex's Nasty Bottom. Which we're drinking tonight. <laughs> yum, is... yum. Ooh, you made one too? It's very nice. Um, I made a cocktail that looks like it, but it is not oh. the same ingredients because these ingredients uh, I did not have. Oh. So it is a mint and a lemon peel and an orange peel and a maraschino cherry, and you all muddle them up at the bottom. That's the nasty bottom. And then you oh. take some Campari, limoncello, uh, bitters. And yep, that makes there. sense. If there's yeah, a there drink you about you, it's got to be bitter. Yep. There you go. Ow! And then you oh, okay. mix that all up in there. And the thing you do Gross is instead of, <laughs> instead of straining it, you put it all in the glass together. And that's it's actually more of a nasty top, let's be honest. But oh. there you go. Nasty topper. That's, yes. that's yeah. It's, I, I completely agree with that. Well done, Stray Bullies. He's a nasty top followed by a nasty bottom. Alex Salvin, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, and on that note, let's bring in our first guest tonight. He is a frequent guest on the show, though he hasn't been here for a year, as we discovered. Yeah. Oh he has a new book that is coming out called The Phoenix Chase, 
that involves some X-Men characters and others that we're going to talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Clyde. Yeah. Hello, Neil. Hey, hey. Hey. Great seeing you. Bottoms. Yeah, what up, Nasty Bottoms? What up, my Nasty Tops? Uh, Neil, welcome back to the show. As we discovered, you were last here a year ago. Yeah, because we were talking Almost about the video exactly. games behind them. Coming yes. straight from the arcade, as yeah. always. That's right, yeah. A year ago tonight. Nice. Ooh. Well, welcome it's back. It's exactly one year? That's exactly crazy. Exactly a year. I, I, I think that has earned me. It's like the, the, it's like the five timers at a certain point. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's the Tuesday before free comic book day is just my night. Right. Nice. Yeah, exactly. I love exactly. it. You're, you know, you're I, the first sign of spring. You're like a beautiful robin <laughs> nesting right here on our show. Aww. And all, yes. Excellent. Uh, well, Neil, I'm very excited about this project you have and your arcade cabinet behind you for anybody listening with X-Men is very appropriate to the Ugh. book. So mm -hmm. you wrote a new novel called The Phoenix Chase. It features um, Quentin Quire, right, is the main character. Yeah. And the Phoenix Egg, and it seems like a lot of fun. What can you tell us about the book? So it is a lot of fun. Uh, oh, thanks for asking. I was able to do a short story uh, about two years ago about it was a Quentin Quire short story in an anthology called The School of X, which is set during the Brian Bendis era of the X Men, and the anthology was about like the the younger generation of X Men, and I got to do this really fun time travel story with. Quentin and Glob Herman and Magneto, and that was kind of it. And then I randomly emailed my editor and said, you know, I think I'm not done like telling Quentin stories and I have like a full book in me. Mm. And so we sort of mm. threw some ideas back and forth. And I've always really wanted to tell like a Marvel cosmic story, like a story set in space. And so the idea was to do kind of like a, like a road trip, like a buddy, not comedy, but a buddy adventure book. Um, and so the idea is that uh, Quentin, because he's Quentin, sets up a third mutant school called Mutant <laughs> Without Borders, and <laughs> he brings a bunch of his friends into it as the early adopters, and they all get kidnapped by these like mysterious aliens. And all they leave behind is a note that says, tell Summers to deliver a phoenix egg. They don't say who they are, where they are, any of that. And so Quentin has to go hat in hand to Cyclops because he figured Scott Summers and say, hey, help me find this. The, this phoenix egg so I can get my friends back but Scott Cyclops because he's Cyclops isn't available and instead he teams up with Alex Summers aka Havoc and it's the two of them with the star jammers out in space looking for a phoenix egg and there's a lot of Marvel cameos in it a lot of really cool uh, continuity stuff that I got to tie in from um, old Marvel comics and like cosmic stuff and it was it's just it was a blast right uh, that's awesome. I I love this these character choices. Now, were you uh, were these all your asks, or was there any sort of like, oh, maybe havoc? Like, how does how does that work with something was, like a, a novel? So it's funny because the, the idea that I really wanted to explore was uh, like a, a book about obviously a fun space adventure, but also a book about teachers and students and fathers and sons. And so the original team up was actually Quentin and Cyclops. It was the two of them. They hate each other. They love each other. I don't know. But they're out in space kind of trying to learn from one another without killing each other. And that was really kind of what I wanted to do. And also bring in, because I love the Star Jammers, um, Corsair, who is Cyclops and Havoc's dad. I love um, Corsair. One of the great things about a lot of the things I write is there's a, a undercurrent of legacy for them, like sons and fathers and daughters and mothers. Like there's a lot of that in, in uh, a lot of those themes in what I write. And so I really wanted to explore Quentin's relationship with uh, like a father figure and a teacher figure, but also that person, which was supposed to be Cyclops with his father as well. Um, and, you know, as a dad, like I have issues with my kids, my kids have issues with me. So it's about like, you know, uh, exploring those relationships and figuring out how they evolve. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but is you, the issues your kids have with you like move over? I want to play X Men arcade game. Yeah, exactly. Uh, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> it, 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 that is probably like on the lighter end of things. Uh, nah. but we won't because that could that. get nasty though. That can really elevate. Oh, yeah. from this yeah, it's not real a nasty bottom session be. here. This is me talking about <laughs> an X Men book. Um, you and I can discuss that over drinks one night, but that's a hundred percent. Hundred percent. Um, so so back to sort of the the character choices. So originally it was Cyclops and Quentin, and unfortunately Cyclops wasn't available. Uh, he mm. was a oh. character. They what a diva. 
Just like with Quentin. Quentin's going through the same thing you are. Exactly, exactly. And a little bit of abandonment. Um, you know, they were using them for something else, and they, they really wanted me to sort of explore other characters and, and have it really uh, was sort of the natural fit there. And actually was the better fit because as I sort of dug into Alex Summers' history and Summers' family, uh, the mess that it is, um, I realized that I had two great characters who have a lot of self-esteem issues and also yeah. um, really uh, are looking for uh, acceptance by their father, their teacher, their mentor, or just the world, right? Uh, and that's kind of what I was looking to explore here. And, and, and really, it came together quite nicely. So, well, uh, oh, oh, I just wanted to ask, I mean, I know you've written prose before. Like you said, you wrote a story about this, but obviously we know you from a lot of your comic book work. When you're doing something like this that is firmly set in the X-Men and Marvel Comics world, how are you picturing it in your head when you're writing it? Are you picturing it as the comic book page or what's what's going on up there? So yes and no. I, I, <laughs> Obviously, I, I, I do a lot of, like, I'm an artist as well, so I do a lot of, yeah. like, what would the next panel be? What would the next panel be? Um, you kind of look at it as a movie almost. Like, you're basically thinking of, like, what's what's the MCU version of this book? And that's kind of how I wanted to really approach this, especially when you look at a movie like, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy or, or you know, anything sort of set in space. Um, I really wanted to be, give it sort of that, it's an intimate story, but give it that, like, cinematic breadth and width, and that's kind of what I was trying to get on the page. Um, and so that's a lot of the times, while I do think primarily in, in panels and sequentials, um, for this one, I really was looking to tell, you know, the, the Marvel TV shows and the Marvel movies and just how they're presented. The nice thing is that because it is a chapter book, right? There's chapters. One of the great things is when you think about a comic, um, how you sort of hit page turns, right? What, what, what are the surprises you want to hit? Uh, at the each and the end of each page, so that you can kind of do a reveal on the next page, or how do you want to end an issue so you can start the next issue? And so for the the, the chapter breaks, right? Like how we ended each chapter, I really did start to think like, if this was a comic book issue, how would I end this to set up the next? Yeah, issue? Uh, yeah. I just want to start by saying, first off, congratulations, man. This is really badass. I'm super happy for you. Uh, secondly, I wanted to kind of dive into your love of space. Uh, was it just the Spaceballs was such a great movie, left a huge mark on you? Or where does that kind of uh, love of space adventures come from? I mean, great question. Star Wars 1977, my friend. Uh, okay. you know, yeah. I'm, I'm old. That was, old. sorry, that was the pre-make of Spaceballs, right? Right, right. right. Prequel. That's the, the, that's like the, the dry prequel, run? The prequel yeah, okay. to the prequels to the prequels. Yeah. Um, Look, I, I love Spaceballs. It's it's my son's actually it's his favorite movie. Um, and that's smart wow, kid. that's and, all right. Um, and we are Mel Brooks, you know, deep here in in, in the Clyde household. But yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are Mel Brooks deep. We, we roll, we roll with Mel Brooks. Um, but for me, it was you know, it's definitely Star Wars, right? So I've been a Star Wars fan since I was knee high, and and I've always wanted to write a Star Wars comic or a book. I mm-hmm. you know. It was my, one of my first movies was Empire Strikes Back. And Ooh. so that's really kind of where my love of space adventure comes from. But, uh, you know, when you think about Marvel, like there's some classic storylines and characters, whether it's the Kree Skrull War or uh, Emperor, Vul- Emperor Vulcan, that whole era that sort of ties into the yeah. book a little bit. Um, any, any, you know, like Lin- the, the classic Ron Marge, Ron Lim, Silver Surfer uh, issues, like, all of that, uh, uh, sorry, not was it Ron Lim, Jim Starlin, I don't know, all of them sort of tie together. Yeah. Infinity Gauntlet, everything that really ties into Marvel Cosmic or Marvel Space um, has always been something that I've loved. And I really have wanted to tell a story in that arena. And so, you know, when I got the chance, I sort of jumped at it. Well, that's what I love about the Star Jammers is that's like a Han Solo and then like a bunch of Chewbacca's flying around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that's so that's sort of the tough part is I actually put a since it's Quentin, uh, and in my short story, I did a lot of pop culture references. There were a lot of Star Wars jokes that I had to kind of dial back a little bit, and, and you know, <laughs> to, to to their credit, like I understand why. But um, <laughs> yeah. you know, Corsair is definitely like Errol Flynn meets Han Solo, and you've got this uh, fantastic group of like aliens and 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 you know diverse misfits, almost kind of like you see in a Star Wars. It's like Muppets meet Star Wars almost, which I kind of yes, like a hundred percent, and so. Like, how can I not want to create in that environment, you know? Um, and so uh, I really had a blast with this. And, and 
because the movie's coming out, I will sort of reveal that there's a Guardians cameo in the book, which was a lot of fun to write. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. Probably some of the some of the best pages I've ever written. Um, wow. and, and, it, and again, like you get to sort of like think of the characters from the movies and really put yourself in that in that headspace, but also balance it out with the way they're presented in the comics and especially how they're presented by Bendis at that time. Uh, and one, I know we were just talking about the characters, but like we haven't talked about Quentin yet, a character that in the main X Men continuity has was extremely important uh, back in the day, and has sort of fallen by the wayside. Uh, what made you want to choose him, and why do you think he's sort of not at the top of the pile of the X Men these days? So he is one of these really interesting characters who, I mean, he was created to be he was, he was a neo Nazi, right? He was like almost a villain, um, yeah, like a threat to, to villain kind of arena um but because he's you know a kid and a student you really didn't want to put him in that same caliber as like a magneto or you know somebody worse and so um he's really evolved over the years you see him go from that really like terrible threat to being sort of more of a nuisance right like kind of like a problem child like almost like you see him in like x-men home alone or something like that (laughs) you know um and then (laughs) recently he was he was comic relief for a little while like he'd pop up in like he was in west coast avengers and he would uh, pop up in like the odd issue of thor and then now with the krakoan era he's kind of this i don't want to say a hero but like maybe an anti-hero but like accepted right. and more mature and really kind of part of x-force and for me what i wanted to explore was where's the area where's the part of that character development where he goes from being like an asshole to being a hero and yeah. That's kind of what the short story started doing. Like the short story was about him learning what it means to be selfless instead of selfish and sacrifice himself through the eyes of Magneto's development over the years. And so this book sort of takes that to the next level and him sort of relating to, you know, um, how Havoc is trying to teach him and instruct him how to, you know, operate in, in space and operate as a hero and him sort of pushing back, but also the lessons he's seeing from Corsair and, and, and you know, around him. And that's really what this book is about. It's about how do you become a hero? And also, like, how do you become a hero but still sort of be the hero that you're supposed to be, right? Like, Quentin is definitely Mm. a rebel, and he's definitely kind of, like, always going to be trying to get one over on somebody, right? And having having to balance the the phrase that we use in the book is being a a train wreck, uh, being, sorry, being a trailer park, but also being the tornado that burst through it so it's kind of <laughs> that's funny that's great uh i did want to take a quick step back and mention something that you said earlier you said that cyclops was off the table he was being used elsewhere what does that mean in this context given that we're talking about a novel versus ongoing sure. marvel so, comics so school of x uh, is put out by a great publisher aconite books uh, they license the characters from marvel and they've got a bunch of authors working on a bunch of different books and characters. And so they don't want like every book to be the same character and every book to be filled with, you know, like the five original X-Men or Wolverine, Wolverine, Wolverine. Right. So you want to have a balance. <laughs> Somebody right? should tell Marvel that by the way, well, Just, you know, throw it yeah. out there. I'm going to stay away from that conversation. Yeah. But, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> don't try to get so Neil fired over here. Come I'm on. I'm working on it, man. Um, so Once a year, I try to get him fired from Marvel, and it hasn't worked yet. <laughs> no. Make it for free comic book day. Um, yeah. So uh, what they've noticed is obviously because this is set, like I said, during that Venice era, and it's set during in, in the Xavier School, which is run by Cyclops and Emma Frost and a bunch of people. Cyclops is in most books uh, at some point. In fact, I used him in my short story at the beginning and the end. And so... It's less maybe that he was not available, but more that they wanted to kind of balance out the cast a little bit. Use some characters that we haven't uh, had the opportunity to see in School of X or in the novels. Um, and so uh, that was probably my biggest uh, note from Marvel and Aconite was, hey, there's some characters we want to maybe see. You know, Can you think about ways to incorporate these characters? Um, because we haven't yet seen them in the series. And that was actually a lot of fun cool. because... Some of the characters they threw at me are characters that I love. Hmm. Um, are you, now that you have this uh, done, <laughs> this is coming out May 16th, by the way. I don't know. <laughs> it's coming out soon. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, it was supposed to come out today, but it's coming out May 16th. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, there's just some schedule changes, but yeah, yeah. it's coming out in two weeks from tonight. Today. Okay, nice. awesome. Um, are you? What else are you working on? What else do you have in on the docket? Are you going to be doing another one of these, or are you going to get another Quentin Choir? Justin? And I would say, uh, can you talk about The Panic a little bit? A book that um, we talked about maybe one year ago, uh, a book that I, I really love. Yeah, so let me tackle each of those. So yeah, um, at, right now, um, while I definitely want to do more uh, in the School of X arena and work with Crack Knight, there's, there's nothing uh, on the docket. I'm still talking to my editors. Well, you know, hopefully something will come together. Um, I'm mostly working on creator own work right now. Um, I've got a Kickstarter starting, I think, in a month for a book nice. that I did years ago called Kings and Canvas, which was uh, a fantasy story um, set in kind of a really post-apocalyptic uh, apocalyptic America. It's about a, cool. a guy who punches his way out of prison and right. uh, fights his way across America, boxes his way across America to get back the family that he's lost. He lost 10 years ago. Um, and it's like a really cool, like Game of Thrones meets Rocky kind of story um, mm -hmm. that I did with uh, Jake Allen and Frank Reynoso. And so we're going to collect it for, for Kickstarter. Awesome. So that's coming up soon. And then I'm working on another um, creator own book with John Broglia, who I did Saber with at Dark Horse, and Ellie Wright, uh, and Sarah Litt, who's our editor. And uh, I can't, we haven't really announced that one yet, but it's about, uh, it's really like a intimate little Jewish suburban crime story set in my hometown. Um, and it's about, oh. it's about responsibility and family and, and religion. It's, it's, it's really, really, um, not just cathartic, but really important to me. Um, oh, nice. One of the things that I kind of want to start doing is really write more um, Jewish comics. Um, working with um, a friend of mine on, on a potential Jewish superhero book, which we're really sort of at the very beginning stages. But you know, as you you know, as you see more and more um, uh, diversity in storytelling, um, I think Jewish representation as a father uh, to kid, you know four kids who love to read and love comics. It's super important to me, and whenever I kind of get the chance to really flex that muscle and tell stories that are part of my heritage and part of uh, who I am, uh, I'm going to do that. And so this story that we're putting out um, is probably one of the more important stories that I've, I've written in a long time. Awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah. The Panic. So The Panic. Yes. Yeah. Out. First issue came out a year ago when we spoke. Uh, since then, we, uh, for those who don't know, The Panic is a five issue thriller that I did with Andre Moody for Comixology Originals that was collected by Dark Horse. And it's about uh, a train crash uh, that happens under the Hudson River and uh, a bunch of strangers who are who survive and have to kind of put aside their political and cultural differences to get out. And Literally, my I, I bring this up. I've talked about this book with my wife and that's her worst nightmare. Uh, truly, uh, like that's what she feared. Having to put your differences basis. aside to work together is your exactly, wife's... Okay. exactly. Right. No, for getting get along, stuck under this, <laughs> having to get along with other people, right? It's, it's terrible. Oh boy, oh, terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, no, it's it's look. There's obviously uh, for me as well. Like one of the worst things that like I'm first of all claustrophobic, and for me to kind of get trapped, I and mean, we've all been, you know. It, in the subway and there's always a part of you at some point is worried like especially when it stops for some reason because there's like a sick passenger or something like that yeah. you're always kind of worried especially after 9-11 right like I heard a lot of stories after 9-11 where people were just trapped in the subway for hours and didn't know what was going on and you know the, the air wasn't working it was just terrible stories about people who had to kind of get evacuated and all of that scares the shit out of me um yeah, so the real title of this book is Neil's Panic. Well, that's pretty much the title of anything I ever write, because <laughs> it's not just Neil's Panic as, like, you know, like, as a father, or Neil's Panic as somebody who doesn't want to get trapped in the subway. It's Neil's Panic as in, is this his last book? Um, <laughs> but, yeah, no, we were really happy with the, with the book a lot. We had a lot of really good feedback. People really enjoyed it yeah. and really loved it. It's really good. And, um, We'd love to do another volume. Comixology is comicsology right now, and right. I'm not really sure what's you know happening there. But um, they've been really supportive, and they're really great. Um, That's awesome. The team over, the, over there has been nothing but fantastic, and and we they want you know we all want to do another 
fine, but just you got to wait for the time to be right. And all the yeah, everything coming into alignment. Totally. Uh, well, Neil, congratulations on the book. Yeah, it sounds awesome. Congratulations on everything. We will see you one year from today. I'll be so, yeah, can't I'll wait. Front of the X-Men arcade. <laughs> <laughs> Great right. start season, the Neil. countdown. Bye, Neil. Thanks, guys. Later, Neil. All right. There oh, we go. Man. Love Neil. Great seeing Neil. Once again, check out the Phoenix Chase coming out May 16th in bookstores everywhere. Yeah. Let's move Shall on. Wait, to- real quick. Shout out to this comment from John Dorsey. Neil, you make me want to buy your comics, sir. Awesome. Oh, isn't nice that cool? Hear. That is very nice. Thanks, Neil. Uh, wait, not Neil. Thanks, John. John. Thanks, there sir. And thanks but to Neil. But also thanks and to thanks Neil, Neil because he's generating the stuff and that And don't makes forget, people- thanks to John as well. Yeah, That's but also right. thanks and, to Neil. Yeah. And thanks to Neil. And thanks to Justin for writing this exchange. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you fucking scab. All right, why don't we bring in <laughs> our next guest? He is the creator of Palomino, which yeah. is currently on Kickstarter and killing it. Ladies and gentlemen, Stefan Frank, hello. Hey, hey welcome. Hey. Welcome. Uh, so I'm looking at it right now. You have 52 hours to go on your Kickstarter as of this taping. This is for Palomino Volumes 2 and 3. You, Your goal is $15,000, and so far you've got $22,908. So uh, you got to feel I, pretty I good. I hope you right don't now. lose seven grand in the next 52 <laughs> hours. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. Like the uh, first, thanks for having me, and second... Yeah, Neil's book looks uh, you know, totally awesome. I was just like, <laughs> it. I was like, where do I get this book? Uh, cool. but, um, yeah, you know, it's funny the thing you suggested, like on the, the first few days of the campaign, there's, you know, that there was a few commissions that I you know, opened up on the, on the, on the campaign because I rarely have time to do any. And there was like the big one, somebody grabbed it. So I wake up the board like, oh, somebody grabbed the big one. And it was a Nigerian prince. And, um, <laughs> and You're like, like, oh, yeah. okay. You know, and then I looked the guy up and he had like signed like all to the, like the biggest pledge on like 22 campaigns that morning. I was like, okay. So it eventually dropped and, you know, and so for a couple of days though, people couldn't get it. It was, it was crazy. It was crazy. Oh, oh what an yeah. emotional roller coaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's tough. Well, it's, it's, well, the good news, aside from that, is this book <laughs> is awesome. Yes. Uh, it is so good. It's, great. it's a great crime thriller. Uh, I guess you say it here, neo-noir graphic novel set in L.A.'s country music club scene. And so uh, set I mean, this up for me. Th- yeah, just to, yeah. to give it a, just a little more context, it feels like a prestige TV series in comic book form. You know, it's almost uh, like true detective E is right. what I would throw out. Right, yeah, right. it's a it's a little like I'll, I'll, let's keep throwing out touchstones. Yeah, uh, definitely. I thought of Chinatown while I was reading yeah. it. Sid yeah. City, mm-hmm. very clearly, particularly oh, with like man. some of the fight scenes later on, felt mm-hmm. very inspired by that in particular. Um, what was without us, uh, Pete? You want to throw out any influences? No, Spaceballs, no. I'm gonna maybe? let him. Uh, I'm gonna let him uh, share yeah. what his Spaceballs. Was. How is was how run. is this like Spaceballs, Pete? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's just like there was two great LA traditions of storytelling that I wanted to uh, to kind of combine. One is the the film noir, the Chinatown, you know, like the town. You know what I mean? Like what's yeah. happening in this town, which is like LA, is this kind of really kind of special place where, with the sun and everything, it's it's very like everything feels super still, but under the surface, everybody's got a million things going on at all times, you know. And so and so that's what that's your LA noir kind of kind of you know, tradition and a lot of the crimes were sort of inspired by, because this takes place in 1981 too, right? So you have that tradition, mm-hmm. um, but there's this other tradition, which is the the LA country music clubs, because people don't know this, but LA used to be a big country music town uh, because yeah. like from the 1930s with like the big Oki migrations, people came to the Central Valley, then they came to the, the Valley here and, you know, Northridge and stuff. And you know, they were working in the, the aerospace, you know, companies of the Cold War. And so there was this whole blue collar union economy where, you know, people, you know, had good jobs, money to spare. And, you know, and they still, they, they brought their culture with them. And so the, the, the nightclubs were huge. You know, like the Palomino was an actual place, right? That had hundreds of people every night of the week. 
like legendary acts played there all the time and it, it was it was kind of crazy at the same time it was kind of like a this little blue color drawing during the day that would come like this world renowned music place at night right um but so that was a real place uh, uh and so you so you had the tradition of the okies you had like the the hippies you know your grand parsons your you know all that stuff so there was like a very and there was the, the world of tv and movies right i mean you've seen the palomino in, in movies like Every Which Way But Loose or Hooper mm. or, you know, stuff like that. So it was like a great musical tradition there. But not only that, but as I said, it was like the crossroads of the music world, different musical cultures. But the TV side, it was a stuntman hangout. It's just like, you know, Jerry Brown used to hang out there when he was dating, uh, dating in the Ronstadt, whatever. So it was like this insane place where any night of the week you could find John Belushi and Jerry Lee Lewis getting drunk together at the bar, right? Which is the way oh, people see that, right? You're selling me on time travel right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, and I think we're getting towards this anyway, but reading through the book, I think the Palomino, which obviously is the title, was this very interesting extra element to me in a certain way, where you have the setup of a detective who's out of the game, who got set, sucked back into it. He's uh, has a daughter who's also kind of interested in what happened to their mom, so you got that mystery going over there. Right. You have the heavies who are like, get away from this, you don't want to be investigating. So you have all of like the noir tropes, but then this Palomino setting brings it to an entirely different level where that I didn't expect. Like it takes it to places yeah. I didn't expect. I assume that was the reason for bringing it in there. You know, yeah, you know, it's, it's it's funny because like sometimes you know you write things and you combine things kind of out of imagination, and as you research it or you know, uh, you you find it like truth was even more. You know, and, and for instance, the Palomino, like the owner, his dad. Uh, 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 had like th this old Model T Ford that was permanently parked in front of the club and was riddled with bullets that the cops shot in there, you know, during the prohibition when the guy was running alcohol and stuff like that. Wow. So that, 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 w once you kind of discover that, so you go, oh my God, this, is, this, this makes total sense. This is really what happened, you know? But for me, so there was like this mix of genre, because there are two genres I really love that, you know, but also, I wanted to do a book that's very lived in, right? Mm. Uh, and and yeah. I, for me, like to get into a story, I need the high concept, and I have a lot of them that are just like on the back burner until I know like what my way into it is. You know, I just like until I'm like, okay, wait, what is this really about? And sometimes I'm, you know, I'm traveling around somewhere, and then suddenly I know what a certain story is about. And this one, as you said, it was the father daughter, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and all of a sudden I knew who they were like, uh, uh, yeah, he's a, you know, he's a former cop who left in disgrace. Now he's a low level PI during the day and working musician at night. And, and so I knew who he was uh, and I knew what the relationship was because, you know, it, and that came at a point where my youngest daughter, uh, you know, maybe like three, four years ago when I started the series, um, was graduating college so it was like a page was turning for me on parenting ah. and, was like, and my daughters are two of them super badass like incredibly badass <laughs> and, very and i was just i know what Great that job. relationship is i know who this is so I, I you know and i wanted to do something that yes on one hand it's like alien war like you've never seen it before because it's yes you're live and die in la and so on and so forth you know but by way of the palomino but at the same time, it's also like an Altman movie. Where's the slice and life mm. of life, you know, uh, um, of the, you know, and uh, um, so, 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 you know, so, so I wanted that feeling that that sort of relationship to be extremely lived in. Then, you know, I raised kids in LA, you know, for, you know, a long time. So, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, like the, 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 the texture of life here too is something in the, of the valley and stuff I really wanted to render. And then the last thing is I'm also a musician, you know, and I, until a few mm -hmm. years ago when I stopped doing it, I've played places like the Palomino from the time I was a kid in France. Oh, nice. In France too, uh, uh, you know, and to, to here, you know, and when I arrived in LA, the, the Palomino was closed, but I became friends with all the musicians from the Pal. In fact, I interviewed a bunch of them in the, and I worked with them in other music situations. 
since then. So like the club life, the feeling, everything about it, I wanted to feel, I wanted it to feel super lived in. Like like you can almost feel the texture of it. You know? Well, uh, well, before you, uh, I, I, I want to see the graphic memoir of your life. It feels like there's a lot <laughs> going on there. Uh, but on the art, um, we haven't talked about that yet. Uh, it feels like, how did you capture the LA noir? Because this, the art I feel like does such a great job of that. It feels like um, Javier Polito in some ways. The like, what, what, what? How did you capture LA noir? Well, to me, it was staying away from the from the landmarks. You know what I mean? Like, you know, yeah. I grew in LA, so I grew up in France. Then I moved to England for a little while. Then I've been in LA for thirty years. Wow. And so, when, when I first arrived in LA, uh, um, I was having. Uh, uh, lunch with a friend, a great servo artist, and we were in this diner and I was like, oh man, this place is so authentic, you know? And he goes like, no, it's not. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Dude, this place is fake, it's fucking fake, you know? And I was like, how do you that know? And he was like, you know, when you're here long enough, you'll know, you know what I mean? And That's so, so true. Right, and, and so coming from somebody who grew up in France, loving American comics, loving American music, playing that type of music myself, you know? It, it, it takes a while before it transitions from cultural appropriation to know this is my life now. I actually know these people. I live there. I'm friends and almost family with these people this way, right? And so to me, the city, you know, is the character. And I, and I think like the authenticity of it, it for instance, uh, um, you know, in the, in the city, in the book, you know, there's this reference to Sunland, you know, uh, like as, you know, one of the characters who ends up being like the murder victim who we're, we're investigating for murder. So that's, uh, 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 and so we see flashbacks and stuff and she's, she's take she's supposed to take this meeting in Sunland. I was like, really? You want to take a really? Are you sure? Because Sunland, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you won't find it on Wikipedia, but it's a place where for years, it was known that where you would dump a body, whether it was the mob or serial killer, you know what I mean? So stuff like that, or like the fact that the, the um, uh, uh, Amy, who's the main character, uh, lives in Silmar, which is a place, again, you will not find on Wikipedia, but it's an actual place down the street from here where a lot of musicians uh, 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 lived and to this day live. Uh, um, uh, and so it's the reality of that, but also, What's interesting with him and something I really wanted to depict was the the working musician, the image of the working musician, right? Because back in 1981, uh, um, you could, uh, you know, you could work six nights a week being in the house band of the Palomino, and that was a good middle class income and you could buy a house. Right. And, you know, in fact, Ironically, you know, and he became family after, you know, but year he passed away now, but there's this guy called Archie Francis, who was drummer at the Palomino for 30 years or whatever, just lived down mm -hmm. the street for it, just had a, uh, uh, but, uh, but so like the image of the working musician, in a way, is like the can canary in the coal mine of the American middle class, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. and so that gives you like the, the 80s as not just like the place where the 50s came to die, like we've seen in some movies, <laughs> but also a, a place where 2016 was born, you know, also, you know? Wow. And so that's cool, you know? And so it's, and then the book okay. is not outwardly political, uh, you know, but if anything, it's honest and it's lived in. You know, it's interesting to hear you talk about lived in and stuff like that. First, let me just back up the truck and say congratulations on raising some badasses. Uh, uh, nice work on that. Uh, secondly, you know, you, you talk about this lived in feel. And one of the things, as someone who reads a lot of comic books, I love the vibe of this comic. The way you started it with some quotes and the art really kind of sets this tone and kind of brings you into this world. It's very conscious and very well thought out. And I just want to say congratulations because a lot of times it takes a little bit to get in a book and to figure out what's going on but you do such a great careful job of like bringing us into this world kind of starting us up and and getting it going and it's just uh it's just such a such a breath of fresh air to kind of be like oh welcomed into this world in this cool way so i just want to say congrats it's really well, fantastic thank you for that you know it, it's funny because like uh um what i uh 
I had the, the same daughter who was graduating in college when I had the idea. It took me a year um, to, to, and she was out of town and I started to send her pages, you know, and, and she was like, dad, this book is making me homesick, you know? <laughs> wow. Um, what a compliment. That's great. You couldn't, you know, so, and so, uh, um, that's when I knew it was like, okay, there's, yeah, you know, it's, there's some, some realness that's yeah. in, in there, you know? That's awesome. um, I did want to ask you about the Kickstarter, though, specifically. So the first volume, correct me if I'm wrong about any of this, yeah. but the first volume has been out. We checked out the second volume as well. This is the Kickstarter for volume two and three. So yeah. it seems pretty obvious when I say it like that. But what is the goal here? Is it to publish uh, volume three? Is it to publish all three volumes? I know this is a four volume story that Lisa that's right that's right out. so you know uh so well so he, you know here's the here's the goal right i just gotta take a step back on the so it makes sense when i started doing because you know i've been doing animation for many many years still am you know um but um when i started also getting back into comics uh, uh 10 or so years ago i i just wanted complete autonomy you know, and so that meant creatively, but also that meant on the the business side, if you will. So, so that, you know, I wouldn't be uh, um, limited by, you know, either like the vision from a publisher or from like even their schedule or whatever. So I was just like, dude, if I'm going to do this on my own Steam, then it's, everything's going to be my way. So so that's why I started uh, uh, Dark Planet Comics, which is my own imprint. Um, mm, and, nice. and so, so the first series that I, that I did, which is silver, uh, uh, which is also was for four volumes. Uh, so that the, 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 the model became, um, you know, Kickstarters, you know, for uh, the, the first run, the first print run of every book. And then we started hitting the conventions really hard and the, the dark planet booth became a little bit of a destination that convention we were doing like 10 some there's some years we did 15 big show the year the booth grew and grew and grew there was there was some places where it was 400 square feet it was like a whole uh -huh. destination and, and so and that ended up being almost like a traveling pop-up store and through that we ended up selling a lot of books independently more than you know a lot of books are sold not independently and so uh, but at some point you kind of reach a, a, a uh, like a level of just what it means in terms of cash flow in terms of everything where you go okay at this point it's you know i need to we need to like shake hands with like a, a bigger company that can fulfill whatever the demand is and stuff like that and so so for silver uh, um we've transitioned it now to this partnership with abrams comic arts who are putting out some okay. really really gorgeous uh, uh um uh what can I call it? Uh, hard covers uh uh and and so for palomino we're in this stage where it's still uh, uh, uh published uniquely through dark planet uh, uh so we do the kickstarter for the the print runs of the books uh, uh we you know, we do the conventions where again, like people have been, and with COVID and everything, that was a big kind of you know bump in the road, obviously. But um, you know, uh, <laughs> so, so through Dark Planet, we you know we do the conventions, we work with the comic shops, the, our web store, and then I, I always want to finish the full series in those terms. So that's the four volumes. Then after that, if there's a need then then we can work with somebody but but that's that's the kind of the, the independent model that, that we're doing now you mentioned that you work in animation is this something that you could see being an animated movie or a series someday i know there's uh, troubles is probably the wrong word but certainly challenges in terms of having a more adult animated series that's out like dc's harley quinn or something like that but uh, have you put any thought in that direction at all so yeah so um I, I do have projects that will lend themselves to animation. I mean, like, first, let me say this. I believe that artistically you could do anything in animation. Yep. Yeah. You, you know, I, I, uh, uh, now they have an expression for it, which is uh, medium agnostic, 
is what you hear a lot, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, and to me, it's just like, yeah, this is basically what it means is animation is a great art form that can tell anything and the least whimsical the subject matter, the more interesting it is because then it's not a hat on the hat. It's an interesting point of view mm. of something grounded, right? So, uh, so I'm all for it. For these particular books, so Silver, uh, uh, there's a... Uh, a, a movie, live action movie adaptation we've been working on. So it's it's been set up as, uh, well, I, also, I don't think there's any issues in saying this. It was at Netflix for a couple of years, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, out of which we got like a great script and a, somebody great attached, but uh, it, it's, uh, uh, but it ended up not moving forward. So now it's one foot uh, different studio. So we'll, we'll see where that is. And Palomino, um, it's it's interesting because you, you mentioned like prestige TV, which is the format that I was thinking about yeah. early early on, um, but um, but now the with the with the shape that the story has taken uh, as I'm in the writing of the fourth one right now, and it's going to be like the, you know, uh, then I'm thinking a movie. And, th- and, and mm-hmm. this is one that I would want to do in live action, if for no other reason than um, to uh, to bring the Palomino, which the the place exists, like the the, the the bar. I mean, like the club itself does no longer exist, but as a place, it does exist. It's, it's still a banquet hall, you know. Uh, um, and, and so, just to bring it back to life for like the time of the shoot, I mean, it would be incredible. You know? Uh, That's awesome. I did want to mention, if it's all right, a couple of the animated projects you work on that I feel like are probably relevant to our (laughs) audience that we didn't mention before. But you've worked on things like, correct me, I'm wrong about any of this, but The Iron Giant. You've worked on Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. You've (laughs) worked on What If... At the yeah. very least, what is season one? I don't know if you worked on season two as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually directing a bunch of episodes for uh, post season one. So, uh, I so uh, I cannot, cannot wait for people to see. Ah, that's so yeah. exciting! Yeah. Just, Where are are you able to say what stage that's in? Because I, I know they've say anything oh, at okay. all whatsoever. <laughs> uh, um, just that we're working on some really awesome stuff. That's all. That's all I can say. Um, you know, even on the well, I'm not gonna say anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like that you got close though. And honestly, no, no, what I, if? Here you go, you go. No, no, you go. I was just gonna say, I feel like what if was something that was like, oh, we're super excited for this. It's part of the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe, and then it turns out that it had all this huge ramifications on so much of the MCU. So the idea of more what if is just so exciting. It feels like such the creative tip of so much of what's happening there. Yeah, it, it's 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 really going to be awesome. And the thing is, uh, what you said is like. Um, what you know i've been wanting to do this type of stuff in animation for a long time you know and but there was a lot of resistance you know for years i mean there's been a lot of incredible projects that we've developed with studios over the years that you know we could have done that stuff 10 15 years ago but but it was just not allowed back then right uh so um but uh what really like got me super super excited when I started working with the Marvel folks is um, the first meeting they said, "Listen to us. We take animation just as seriously as we do live action. That we don't want it to be any different. Uh, where the stories are going to be approached with the same, uh, um, you know, the same care, the same." Uh, uh, it's of course there's not one tone as you can see even in season one or even in the the mcu there's like a a variety of tones right uh um but within that palette you know will be in there you know and so and so it's like okay well you know what then that's what i'm I'm in you know (laughs) (laughs) that's great and yeah and oh Oh, I was just going to ask. So on season one, you were the animation supervisor, I believe, right? right? And now you're moving into directing some episodes. Since, I mean, I'm not familiar uh, with necessarily animation positions. What is the difference there? What does that mean that you did on season one versus what you're doing on season two? So um, when you do animation uh, in general, 
uh, the acting performance is split into. I mean, I know it sounds basic, but people don't necessarily think of it this yeah. way. Just like if you took your actor and you split that performance in half, you have the vocal performance and then you have the animation performance that needs to step in that river, dig, you know, and, and just, and, uh, you know, uh, um, reconnect with it, rediscover it to to honor it and to just fully realize it but also sometimes even you know you can push it or you can you, you know uh, so so like the any people don't you know in, in you know in animation people tend to call animators anybody who works in animation mm -hmm. but any anima animators right. like an animator is a very very specific position actually in animation and it's the person who um is you know the visual half of the acting performance and so uh, um so when you're working with uh, so when you're an animator right you, you get the you know the, the, the vocal performance that's been already recorded and then you you have to sort of in, internalize it and recreate it and do your take on it uh, and bring your own level of performance uh, either by drawing it or animating it, if it's CG, you know, whatever, right? But but it's that's what it is. And so, like, being the... But, of course, there's challenges to that. One is that, obviously, it's an acting job because you're dealing with an acting performance, which you can't fuck up, you know? But at the same and time, uh, um, you know, if it's a real person and you say, okay, walk down the street... Everybody knows how to walk down the street. You know what I mean? So th there's not this kind of base layer on how do we even execute this and the mechanics of it that also have to be correct and working. Because if you don't have that bedrock of, you know, again, your disbelief doesn't get suspended because it looks weird. And, and then there's you have nothing to build the acting on. So being the uh, animation supervisor means that you're supervising so you're working with like teams of animators and there's a bunch of them and, and, and uh, um, working with the technical aspect to make sure that the movement feels natural, that the poses feel cool enough, powerful enough, that, that I develop this whole language of what is it to a, that is a Marvel pose for not a Marvel pose, you know what I mean? Um, so that, uh, uh, and then of course, all the acting choice, you know, like when, they, because obviously some of those vocal performances are, very rich, you know, and as you know, you know, when you're acting, <laughs> I hate to say when you're acting because it feels so, but, uh, but <laughs> in the process of an acting performance, uh, you don't always mean what you say. Sometimes you mean the opposite. Maybe yeah. it's ironic. Maybe you're lying. Maybe da, da, da. So having been by nature kind of divorced from that, that performance, having to reconnect with it, that also so you're like an acting coach if you will to the team at the same time wow. so so that's what i did and then at the end of that uh the uh, and which by the way i had not done in a long time because most of the stuff i've been doing was writing directing you know stuff and uh, uh and then i said well you know this would be helpful to us if you did this and i was like yes it's, are you kidding me working with these characters you know I'm down you know Plus, my drawing shops were up because of the comics, so I jumped into it. And then when they said, you want to uh, direct more stuff, then I was like, yes. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, and I did want to ask you, obviously, you've worked on a ton of projects over the years that are very beloved, but I did mention Iron Giant. And I, oh, yeah. I think that's such an interesting movie, yeah. just in terms of when it came out, I think it did fine, maybe not even fine. Maybe it didn't do that great when it came yeah. out at the box office, but... Yeah. It has become one of the most beloved animated movies uh, of all time yeah, over the yeah. decades. What was that initial experience like working on it? And then what has it been like years later as you've seen it just grow more and more in terms of impact? So it's it's really interesting. And so uh, uh, the, that uh, the um, uh, um, yeah uh, um, that there was a, a, a a context that made everything you're talking about happen, the good and the bad, but without that context. Mm -hmm. And the context was that one of the, so it all came from the Disney stores, mm -hmm. right? In, in the nineties, the Disney store starts to do huge business, right? Mm -hmm. Selling the, you know, 
Little Mermaid toys and whatever, right? And then Warner Brothers like, we want some stores too. We all started the Warner <laughs> in every mall in America. It was the '90s, right? Remember it was party, right? So, um, but where are we gonna put in the stores, right? So, well, that's why we need animation. And then they get into this mindset that they need to do feature animation just like Disney, so they can have characters and toys to put in the stores, which is the thing they really want. Uh, uh, and so they they invested a lot of money in building a studio, which we called what was called uh, Warner Brothers Feature Animation at the time. And we did a first movie there, which was exactly what the studio wanted, which was a big musical with you know, blah, 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 singing dragons, you name it, blah, blah, the, the, which, which was <laughs> their idea of what a Disney musical is, you know, which is, you know, like it was just, you know, it's, Crazy, whatever. So, so at the end, so we, you know, uh, um, so we made that movie, which is exactly what they wanted, uh, and they really believed in it. Like I have this memory on being like on the lot, uh, like the week before it came out. It was like the, the family and crew screening or whatever, and talking to like some of the Warner execs, and we're like, oh, you know, and, and, and <laughs> the movie came out and literally did zero business, you know. And at that point, Warner was like, well, fuck that shit. You know, it's just, <laughs> you know, you know, let's shut it down, right? <laughs> so um, they, um, and but then somebody said, wait, you can't shut it down because, uh, you know, you still have everybody in your contract for one more year and you have to lease in the place for one more year. And literally they said, well, what director we have? And they said, well, we have this guy called Brad Bird. We got him because we bought Turner Animation and he was developing something at Turner. So maybe, you know, maybe he wants to do something. And, and like Warners was literally like, just do whatever and then turn off the light, put the keys in the mailbox when you're done. And that's <laughs> wow. It. That's the fluke that made the Android happen. Ah. And Brad took this and did something just phenomenal. And, uh, um, but, you know, the flip side of that is that Warners didn't care. So there was zero promotion. I mean, mm. like, we got the release date six weeks before the movie actually came out. Which is oh, insane, my God. Right? Man. So, uh, but, so that's, that's unfor unfortunate. But at the same time, had they cared, it would have not been the Iron Giant. Had they exactly. Cared, it had been another musical with Singing Dragons, right? So it's like it was a fluke. And the thing is that, and then so the movie comes out, and so uh, to uh, that was a long way around your 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 the thing you were saying. But um, when we were working on it, so for me it was like, holy, sh you know, this is exactly. So I, I I was working on the other movie. Well, first here's the thing: like when I met Brad for the first time on that movie, because he started meeting people and stuff, you know. And when I was a kid in France, you know, like doing animation and stuff like in my room, uh, I was doing this, uh, this animated short film of the spirit, Will Eisner, the spirit, right? Mm -hmm. I told you oh, that, awesome. You know, cool. years ago. It, it, I mean, it's a kid's, it's kids work, right? But it's, it's, I, it, I found doing it as a kid. And so, but I'm going to, but it was very hard to find any information on animation. And so I would like have to schlep over to the public library, like every whatever. And there was this one magazine about animation that would come out like once in a blue moon. And one time I would get there, oh my God, there's a new issue. And I read and I read, I read. And there's this thing at the end where there's some guy in LA called Brad Bird who's going to make an animated version of the spirit. I'm like, who the fuck is this? Guy? <laughs> <laughs> I'll kill him. Thing, right? I'll kill this guy. <laughs> so. So then, I, you know, when when I met him the first time, I was like, I was like, before we start, you should probably know that I'm the you're my that. arch enemy. <laughs> I've been trying to kill you with my thoughts since I was seven years old. So, uh, but but then, man, we watched the reels, and you know, they say it goes back to what I was saying earlier, right? It it was not an animated movie in the sense of the tropes. It was just a movie that happened to be animated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh my God, this is, this is my dream project, you know? And, and uh, so as we were working on it, we kind of had the feeling that we were doing something sort of important, like we we're going to advance the art form. 
And then, of course, the movie came out and did nothing. And, you know, and uh, for the reasons we all knew, but it was still kind of disheartening. And then, like, things started to happen. Like, mm. uh, uh, like I was uh, uh, in a bar, you know, just like listening to a band and stuff. And, and I'm talking to one of the musicians and he's like, oh, so uh, with, uh, with animation. Uh, and like, what do you, where have you worked on? I was like, yeah, it's just stuff you probably never heard of. He's like, yeah, giant. <gasps> Take giant. <laughs> it's my favorite movie. He said that. And I was like, you heard of it? Are you kidding me? You know, and, and so, and it's, it's been nonstop that for like the following ensuing like 25 years, right? And if I had uh, a nickel for every time somebody like, told me that i could i'd pay for the sequel you know <laughs> but um yeah so it, it's and people have found it you know yeah um, it's always amazing to me stories like that that start with like yeah the studio didn't care about this so we got to do what we wanted and it's like a hugely successful <laughs> story it's like we got one through and there's yeah. so many movies that you're that are just like yeah they were really into this it was hot trash <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know that's that's crazy you know and, and to me you know it's funny because it's been kind of my experience for years and years that for real good stuff to get through uh it has to be some sort of a fluke or some sort of like mm, you know, right. all under the radar and then which is why i wanted to do the comics independently you know because i didn't yeah. ever wanted to run into a situation where people would say you sure we're not allowed to do this right so uh, but um and which is why i i you know love you know the, the marvel gang so much because that was really the the maybe the first time in a long career where the great stuff was not a fluke it was not it, it was the it was on purpose you know you know what i'm saying like the studio was 100 percent behind like fully understood the characters the world the whatever you know and it, it was just you know just at no point was there that second guessing mm -hmm. that is you know that is always there when you know it's just like a, yeah but is it like the nice the last thing that did well you know, you know what i mean just, it was, yeah, it was yeah. Like that. so so the, which is why that's that's an amazing experience well like we were talking about i think we can really uh, just to bring it back to palomino i think you could really feel that in terms of what we were saying that it it has the tropes of noir and you know what's going on and you know these characters but there's that extra level of something that makes it really fascinating and something that you haven't seen before so I think it's great. I'm excited to check so out it. Yeah. Yeah, having read volume one and two earlier today, I'm very excited to check out volume yeah. three. And Can't wait. Clearly it's successful. you got a couple more hours, so good luck on it. And uh, fingers crossed, good luck for volume four as well. Thank you so much. Thanks all for right, thanks for chatting. Thanks so yeah, much. Thanks we so can much, talk man. all night. <laughs> yeah. Great to hang. Yeah. All right, there we go. Once again, uh. that was Stefan Frank, and the book is Palomino. It's on Kickstarter right now, as of as of right now, for about another fifty hours, and it is awesome. If you like new oh my God. So good. good books, definitely check it so out. So cool, so yeah, cool. We are going to move on with our next section, which is my first section because you make it yeah. up. It is your audience question. Audience oh, question. It's the audience question. Oh, and we already got we already got questions popping. We do, so but uh, if you want to get us a question, all you got to do is leave it in the comments on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch, and we're gonna get them. Uh, before we do, though, what you guys drinking? I'm still working on my nasty bottom. Oh, right. You always are working on that. No matter what you do, you still got to put the work in. Um, I finished off um, a cocktail that looked like a uh, Stray Bullets cocktail, but it was actually uh, tequila, uh, a little bit of Campari, and a Fever Tree grapefruit tonic Ooh, was what I did. It was a tequila really tonic. Nice. And it was very good. An up and out hazy IPA is that what you're drinking, Pete? That's right. A little uh, Philly special, so it's uh, delicious. Excellent. Philly Ooh, special, I... isn't that getting eating two cheesesteaks and then dying? Uh, <laughs> I wish. We'll see. Uh, and I'm also drinking Conehead IPA. 
All know. right. Shout out to the Coneheads. All right, man. Uh, well, let's kick this off. This is with a big question. We've been actually talking about this one a lot, so I'm excited to chat about this. This you is from over on Twitch. I believe that's Emma, our first Twitch question. First yeah, Twitch, question. Twitch, what's up? Uh, from Emma19988, if you could choose any celebrity to see get tickled, who would it be? Uh, that's <laughs> a great question. This, I would, like, question, to, I. I would like to do someone who's like a tough guy to see him break, you know? Mm-hmm. So I would go with like Idris Elba or something, you know? Be Let fun. me ask you, Pete, when you say I'd like to do someone, you mean you're the one doing the tickling? You're the tickler in this situation. No, I'm the person like holding them down, you know what I mean? Oh my like God. strapping oh, even them, strapping to a, uh, you know, something. Shouts to that, even weirder answer from Pete <laughs> And let's, let's use this question to plug um, our Patreon uh, member level, which I think. Oh, yeah. uh, that's right. Uh, is it there a level? Where I think we it's five thousand dollars. Pete will film a tickle video video for you. Well, yeah, that's not real. So uh, maybe no, we should connect real. with Emma. It's this feels like definitely a money not maker. real. It's definitely yeah. not real. Pete, do you count as a celebrity? Because I'd love to see you get tickled for five thousand dollars. Certainly, amongst the three of us, Pete is a celebrity. Uh, I don't know about all that, L.A. Justin. <laughs> Great You're question. A to me. Wonderful Thanks. first Twitch question. Thanks, as well. AI thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Prime NRG. Question for the boys. Any excitement for the Netflix show announced based on the Boom Studios Mech Cadet U comic? Ooh, that's very exciting. I did not know about that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's great. Yeah. Great. Good uh, reaction. Yes, I am also <laughs> excited. Uh, this is based on Greg Pox comic, which yeah. is very fun. I think think it's Love animated i could be wrong about that i was gonna say uh, i'm excited whenever there's a uh, netflix animated announcement animation yeah. announcement and i'm that's what my assumption would be as well yeah but very great very good for greg pock original Pac! we gotta get him back on the show man we absolutely do uh let's move on to stanley are you excited to see guardians 3 any expectations Ooh. Ooh. Uh, what's up? First off, what's up, Stanley? Um, yeah, I uh, I'm very Stan excited. Uh, Stanley, not Stanley. It's Stanley, uh, like we'll flat Stanley. Are you excited to see Guardians three? Any I, expectations? <laughs> to be fair, Mine that is a very sky st- high. Excelsior! <laughs> no, I am. I'm very excited. I felt like the second one was a little bit of a uh, letdown. I'm hoping the I've third one. I've come back to life, and gonna... I'm back for vengeance. I'm hoping the third one will have it end in a nice way because I thought the first one was amazing. Justin, what about Uh, you? Any expectations? Yeah, I mean, I think this movie feels like it was a a long path to this movie um, through COVID, through James Gunn being on it, off it, on it. James Gunn then progression through it to his current job over at DC. It feels like this movie is, um, you know, three balls, two strikes, your time it's time to hit so like i think the expectations are high and high I, expectations okay i do think that the movie will deliver on those expectations it feels like they Ooh. went with all the emotional beats based on the limited uh, reviews coming out so far rather than trying to do a bunch of connective uh tissue to other marvel project marvel projects i my big thing, and we've talked about this a little bit already. Is, Have you seen it already? No. I am no. nervously concerned about the content nervously of the movie. Concerned. Well, just in terms of like how horrific it is. Because I feel like more days go on, the more people have seen it, the more people are like, wow, very emotional. Two and a half hours of grueling dark animal torture. Don't take the kids. And the oh, more I shit. hear this, the more I'm That's like, what people are saying? There, there's been a lot of that. There's been well, a fair amount I, of that. I think you're telling, we're talking about Rocket's origin, I think. And it's yeah. going to be that, because that's yeah, the origin. Be, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I don't think it's like, it's probably... It's not leaning I would into argue, it. I bet it is. I bet it's a little gratuitous, because that's what, you know, this movie, that's what James Gunn sort of does, I think. Leans into, if the whatever's on the table, he'll lean into it. So I yeah. bet we get a, just a little too much of that, but I don't think it's occupying the whole movie by any means. Gosh, I hope not. That's my main worry yeah. right now. I'm going to have to vet that for my kids. Uh, John Dorsey says, Whiskey and Mountain Dew, anyone? Hey! Literally no one. Literally no one. Oh, wow. come on, man. Uh, if you had a little vodka in there instead of the whiskey, uh, it'd be all for it. A whiskey, vodka, and Mountain Dew. From Scheuchler, fave European, not UK, comics. 
Whoa, real line in the sand there. The end call. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm going to choose the end call. You guys go ahead. You, uh, this, is, you, this is the answer you always I give. mean, ask me to name literally any other European continent. Well, that's, I think, what the question really is getting to, and I don't know them either. Great. There you go. Great question. Uh, but look, there are lots through. of them. The problem is I don't think we get a lot of them. Like, mm. in a quick Googling, I got the comic The Weatherman, which I Ooh, did read. Oh, yeah. Enjoyed, Weatherman but, was great. Yeah. What but about, I don't like, know. The, the French Disney comics that are, like, very sexual? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you really? Know you like those? those? Huh. Yeah. Big yeah. surprise. Ooh. Twist. Oh, boy. As Justin says, that's just the creative tip. Nice. Uh, this is also from Sharkler Shift to MSQ. What comic book character to get tickled? <laughs> Hulk. Wow. You gotta go with Hulk. Hulk? Yeah. Wow. You would tickle the Hulk? That seems like a poor decision on your part. Well, it would be fun. Risky, but I'll tell you what. He needs it. He needs to be losing. He needs yeah. it. He needs what about, like, Mr. Fantastic? He's got a lot of skin going on at any point. There's plenty of tickle spots. I don't know. I don't know if that's how should I have not said that. Like, yeah, yes, that's you should. Yeah, that's very right. true. You should not have. I uh, shouldn't have written that for you. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, the thing would be a uh, tough tickle. Let me. Yeah, that's that. a tough. You got to use a rake or something. Real quick, this is. Uh, I know we've all done this in our heads before, but just rank the most ticklish members of the Fantastic Four from like most ticklish is number one to least ticklish is number four. Uh, nice. Well, that's I would, hard. I would do it, but I think that's an upcoming arc in Ryan North's Fantastic. I think that's the plot of the movie. I've heard. Yeah, the been, movie? That's the problem. Why they've been talking about so many different actors to play the Fantastic Four is they've been looking for the most ticklish actors in Hollywood. Yeah. Are you ticklish? Number one question in any casting yeah. situation. The offer. This is the big rumor right now. The offer for Sue Storm went out to Margot Robbie. The offer was just a, a little feather. It was a little feather. <laughs> I was like tickling. Ten little tickle. Tickle right I mean, I tickled the Punisher briefly. Yeah. That's dangerous. Mm. Shoot some sort of feather gun. Great. This is from Stray Bullet. He, uh, We chatted in the Slack about James Gunn's comments about casting the new Superman. Do you guys agree with me that the new Superman needs to be almost a good, as good of a person as Superman himself? Meaning the actor. Needs yes, to be... and I thought I thought this was a great comment that uh, Stray Bullet made in the, in the Slack. Uh, sort of sifting through James Gunn's uh, comments and it not being about how Superman needs to be like a good person, something I think we all know, uh, someone that needs to be hugged. In our recent Marvel Vision podcast, we talked about how it's, I said like, oh, I think that's something an actor will, portray, will portray in Sons their of eyes. A Sons of a Gun. Are so, sorry, Sons of a Gun. Sons, oh, yeah. right. That makes that We makes do a lot sense. of podcasts. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, Sons of a Gun, it's, it'll be portrayed through the eyes. That's where you'll see this like um, heartfelt inner core. But uh, Stray Bullet made a great point. Like it goes beyond that. I think the he thinks the actor uh, himself needs to be a good person, someone who like the we the culture recognize as like that person is nice and as a as a celebrity as themselves. And I thought that yeah, was I mean they point. they kind of have to to be able to. It's such a huge mantle, you know. I mean, you go back through you, you know. We were talking about legacy earlier, you know. Christopher Reeves, all these like amazing people who have kind of uh, uh, blazed a, a trail. Yeah, I agree with uh, Stray Bullies. And in case you're like, hey, how do I get on this amazing Slack Patreon? That's how you do it, and then you can join these fun conversations that we have. Uh, it's a lot of it's a lot who of great. Are you? Who, who have you been great replaced by? Yeah, it is. Patreon.com slash comic book club. You're absolutely right. And we got one last one here. This is from John Dorsey. Comic Jason, what are your thoughts on Mad Magazine creators like Mort Trucker, Angelo Torres, Jim Davis, and the death of Al Jaffe? R.I.P. Jim yeah. Davis, the Garfield guy? Take it easy. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I uh, when I first moved to the city years ago, I when I was I was living in Boston before I moved here and I worked Boo. on a, a, ma a magazine out of New York called Jest Comedy Magazine. Hell I yeah, dude! I worked at Jest. Yeah, I also worked at Jest. Wow, Shouts. that's crazy! I didn't know we all yeah. did. That's really funny. Uh, but I met met some people there, wrote a bunch of articles for Jest, and um, ended up getting connected with some people at Mad, and I got something published in Mad Magazine, which was like what? a uh, great stream. Honestly, funnily enough, it was an Archie uh, Comics adjacent uh, one page, a splash page. It was, um, this was, uh, this dates how long ago this was. It was a 
uh, Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt, Jennifer Aniston, Archie. Uh, oh, uh, I see what you did there. A little love yeah, triangle. Was, was, it a, was it a fold-in? It wasn't a fold-in. It was just uh, a one-page sort of like Hollywood takedown. Spy versus type. spy? Was it a spy versus spy? Yeah. Okay, All right, this yeah. is the part where who Alex was just who? lists things that he knows from Mad Magazine. But, but let me say, so I was, was like it a super... cover of Mad Magazine? No, no, super worry. excited, super proud worry? to get something in there as a young like That's comedy That's huge, person. man. Very huge, and um, because of that, I got to go to the um, offices. Uh, the, the offices, yes, but also like with this, like animators or this um, uh, illustrators club or something, and got to meet a bunch of those guys. They sat wow. in the back. They were very old. They didn't want to talk to any of the young people, but got to shake hands and like have uh, cocktails in this. Like, I was new to New York. It was like to be in the back of this room, like in the middle of Manhattan. It was one of like my favorite memories of coming to this city. Oh, to be wow. Dude, that was awesome. huge. Yeah, it was great. And what are we... So anyway, I love all those guys. Yeah. Even that... though they're very ornery. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's awesome. I think I mean, uh, let's end this on a high note, though. We do actually have one more question here. Prime Energy asks, question for Pete, Mountain Dew or Punisher? One of them has to go. Well, I feel like I could... Quit Mountain Dew, but I can't quit the Punisher. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> All right. That is not what I what was a, expecting. What a startling turn. <laughs> yes. Uh, and that is it for your audience question. <laughs> now we are going to move to our next section, which is trivia. And for that, we're going to turn it over to Pete LePage. Hey! LePage. This is the part we give back to you, the lovely audience. It's an opportunity to win 25 free dollars to Midtown Comics Online. Because if you had 25 bucks, you'd go for some comics. Or, of course, Long John Silver for some reason, because Alex is a weird. Uh, all right, we're looking for Should first hand it? up. Nobody's taken Long John Silver's in a while. Yeah. Should we do yeah, something do, different? Like, so, uh, Should we just stop doing Long John Silver's? You know no, I mean? no, I don't think so. Hmm. 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 Maybe like... I uh, mean, people, what's wrong with like some like delicately fried fish? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Outback mm -hmm. Steakhouse? There's more of those. We could do that. Huh. We want to kill somebody with a blooming nut? I don't know <laughs> if we can do that. Um... I've been addicted to Jersey Mike's. Is that, is that oh, how that? is that? One oh. opened up in Park Slope. I haven't been there yet. Oh, it's glorious, man. You got to yeah. get the juice. Hit what it two times mean? with the juice, bro. What is that? Two mean? times? Two it's times like with the this, juice, the bro. The salad dressing what? stuff. Oh, is salad dressing on, not like salad orange, dressing, not oil, orange it's like juice? A, the oil and vin is what it is. You, listen, don't trust me. Just ask mean? for it. You'll be happy. What's better, Subway Jersey or Jersey Mike's? Jersey Mike's. Wow. Uh, you got a okay. you got a, a hand waving in the comments here on YouTube. Mm. Oh hey, you got Mike right, Wheeler. Great. Mike Wheeler waving the hand around. First hand up guy. All right, here we go. Uh, yes, yeah, so Mike, just to clarify, since Pete clearly is not saying this out loud, That's all right. you have to do <laughs> is answer the questions clearly in the comments. Happening. We're on a little bit of a delay, so just drop the answer in the comments there, and we will. All right, here we go, Mike. Uh, today's trip is a topical <laughs> comic news and a small nod to the legend, Jerry Springer. Jersey Mike. Oh. R.I.P. Jerry. Jerry. All right, please listen to all three options before making your selection. Here we go. Question number one. There is a new horror Archie comic coming out in June called Blank. Is it A, Camp Pickens, B, Bughead or Death, or is it C, Michael Winslow? So, what would you think wow. there, Mike? Obviously, A is the way to go. What are you feeling there, Mike? Let us know. And this is by, it's already in the comments. Uh, I mean, if it's the real one, I would say that Camp Pickens is by Tim Seeley. Touch hey! Feeling, Tim Seeley. Touchy feeling, Tim Seeley. Ooh, that's going to be great. All right, cool. Here we go. Question number two. Greg Pox. Oh, you're just Greg blasted ahead. Okay. Uh, Mike hasn't answered yet, but I guess you trust that. He... Oh, I thought you said he answered in the comments. And oh, he typed A. He did it. There you All go. Right, great. Just All remember, right. there's like a 20 to 30 second delay, so you got to make up shit. Great. You're doing great. That's All also right. called hosting a podcast. <laughs> These are fun. Anyway, Greg Pak, uh, who we all uh, agree should be on the show very soon. Uh, Greg Pak is a new comic coming out. It seems like a great time to plug it on our live show. Uh, coming out late May called Blank. Is it A, City Boy? Oh, that sounds cool. Or is it B, Greg Pak is awesome? Or is it C, Maria Menounos? 
Mm. Very cocky to to do be a comic about how uh, he himself, the author, is awesome. Well, you know, if anybody can pull it off, it's Greg Pak. I mean, that guy is... I don't know. Maria Menounos can pull off a lot of stuff. She's now, in a lot of... Have you ever seen Nuvi at the movie? Oh, man. I tell you, I get there early the... just for that. A little behind the scenes, when you're sitting there with a blank slate, you got B there, what made you write Greg Pak is awesome? Well, uh, it come from the heart. You know, sometimes when I don't know what to do, I just speak from the Bees heart. Bees come from the heart. Great to know. Well, not bees all bees come from the heart. Not all bees. All right, here we go. <laughs> not all. Bees. Last one. The star. <laughs> the star of the boys. Yeah, trending post. Hashtag not all bees. Question uh, number three. Mike, Mike set picked A, and it was, that's correct. Question number three. The star of the boys, Anthony Star. See what I did there? Uh, said this about I season it's four. Anthony Star. <laughs> Is it a truly the most bizarre thing I have ever done? B Never says anything or C, tell her. Wait, what was the question again? I missed the question. <laughs> what did Anthony Starr say about the next season of The Boys? Uh, and of course, it's A, it's the most crazy uh, thing Anthony. he's ever been fucking that a part sense. of. I like that you dropped C, tell her, <laughs> as the answer. Uh, well, Mike Wheeler says A. There you go. Triple A and a triple A trivia quiz. Pete. Yeah. What were you paying tribute to here? Well, of course, I'm talking about the 2015 hit TV movie, Sharknado 3. Oh, hell no. Great. Nice. Great. That's great. All right. So I'm going to shoot Mike the information on getting our gift card. In the meantime, new comic books are coming out all the time. They sure if are. If you would like to talk about comic books. <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay? Did you Uh-oh. just break? Did your I'm head? Fine. I'm just... trying to do too many things at the same time. Yeah, you are. Yes. Pete, what are you looking forward to that's coming out this week? I'm looking forward to The Joker, The Man Who Stopped Laughing, number eight, and Radiant Black, number 24. Excellent. Justin, what about uh, you? Really good stuff. I got to shout out um, Batman 135. Oh, really? Right Interesting. Number, uh, which yeah, is, is um, got a, I just, I don't want to spoil it by saying it's got a lot of, going on sure does i'm looking forward to getting into that with you yeah and uh, just one other sort of surprising book for me groot number one by um dan abnett uh, really gets into some some marvel history that i was pleasantly surprised by and i again don't want to spoil it uh i will throw out there star signs number one from image comics written by saladin ahmed art by megan levin saladin ahmed did a book called terror war that came out a couple of weeks ago that was a really fun crazy sci-fi concept this is a really fun crazy fantasy concept so Good stuff coming from him. And all of those books are going to be in our Stack podcast that comes out Wednesday at 9 a.m., both in the Stack feed and the Comic Book Club feed. And, folks, that is it for this week's show. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of people we want to thank. We want to thank Neil Clyde for coming on to check out The Phoenix Chase, which hits bookstores everywhere on May 16th. Also, Stefan Frank. We're talking about Palomino, yes. which is on Kickstarter currently and is awesome. Definitely track that down. Next week, we are going to have a big show with some big guests. Rodney Barnes is going to be here to talk about Blackula, Return of the King. And nice. we are going to have Brian Michael Bendis. What? And Michael Avon Oming. What? Who? On to talk about the reboot of Murder, Inc., Jagger Rose from Dark Horse Comics. And maybe we'll sneak Ooh. in some other questions about other stuff. I guess we'll see. Yeah. A couple of other things to plug here. Candyman, our Sweet Tooth podcast is ongoing every single day. We just had a good chat with Jim Mickle, the showrunner of Sweet Tooth. That should be going up later this week, so that's very fun. Sons of a Gun, our DC podcast going weekly. Check that out. Marvel Vision, our Marvel podcast, also weekly. Also check that out. Riverdale After Dark, recapping the episodes going up every week as well patreon.com slash comic book club support the show and all the shows we do don't forget to subscribe on apple android spotify stitcher or the app of your choice at comic book live on twitter comic book club live on instagram and tiktok comic book club live.com for this podcast and many more until next time good night thanks everybody Later. shout out to anthony mark has given us a like yeah, yeah. and riley trahan <laughs>
That's it. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Later. Zalbin is a nasty boy.